you're looking at a CRT TV sandwiched between a chair and a storage box. To your left, a radio and a couple of books collecting dust on a shelf. Turn around, a coffee table and two couches. Framed photos line the walls, all depicting serene shots of nature. Natural light trickles through the two windows, but not much. The kitchen and living room are adjoined. A used pan and teapot left on the gas stove. Who hasn't been there before? Essential kitchen appliances are scattered across the countertop. A coffee maker, toaster, torn roll of paper towels, cleaning supplies, and a food scale. This kitchen isn't anything special, but it gets the job done. Right nearby is the laundry room with some tools stored in case you need to do some maintenance. Go down the hall and you'll find the bathroom door to your right. A toilet, shower, and sink. All intact. There's even a plastic drinking cup there to store your toothpaste and toothbrush. At the other end of the hallway is the bedroom. A dresser and a desk on one side. A bed, seemingly a full-sized. And a nightstand on the other. Another scenic photo hangs above the bed, decorating the wall. A walk-in closet's nearby as well, used mostly to store shoeboxes. Last but not least, another set of windows. The view outside isn't much to write home about, but soothing all the same. Maybe it has something to do with it being overcast today. I don't know about you, but I've always been fond of those days. Feels as if the weather is barely holding itself together. Putting in enough effort to keep up appearances, but could burst at any moment. This is room 302 of South Ashfield Heights. The apartment Henry Townshend has called home for two years. Built decades ago, it is generally unremarkable. Like any old apartment out there, I'm sure you've seen a similar one before. But there is one thing that makes it stand out. A recent addition. A series of chains appeared one day, locking him inside. There is no way in or out. And the walls are closing in faster than he might realize. Are you yearning for that special place to spend quality time with your loved one? Do you need to relax and get away from it all? Come to Silent Hill for the ultimate peaceful getaway. Silent Hill 4 has always been considered the black sheep of Team Silent's original run with the series. It breaks the mold in just about every way, a mold many didn't think needed breaking. Some might even say that it killed the series. I instead would argue that its priorities were just ahead of its time, especially for a PS2 game. Years before PT, before Resident Evil 7, before Signalis, Silent Hill 4 was a horror game where the terrors of the supernatural invade a lived-in, detailed space. The game scales itself back from the town-sprawling horror mysteries of the original trilogy, and tapped into a more intimate horror. A smaller, haunted, more domestic horror. Our goal in designing the room was to give it a sense of reality, like you were really living there during the time you were playing the game. I think that even in everyday life, there are many things you encounter throughout the day that can give you a sense of fear, but in the Silent Hill series, it's a matter of how much of a sense of everyday life and reality we can make the player really feel. Setting your scary game mainly in a cramped apartment isn't something you do on a whim. The unspoken fear depicted in the setting of Silent Hill 4 touches on the anxieties of adult life in ways I haven't seen since The Silver Case. So naturally, I was immediately drawn to it. In a series that adores subtext and begs its players to extrapolate meaning from its obscurities, Silent Hill 4 goes the extra mile. And today, I'd like to take time to do some extrapolating of my own. 
to read between the lines and see what stories Silent Hill 4 tells through its atmosphere, to observe the themes born from its vibes. This isn't a review. I just want to talk about Silent Hill 4. Where do you even begin talking about a game like this? Let's set the stage. Henry is trapped in a series of dream worlds as part of a ritual performed by a deceased serial killer named Walter Sullivan. Silent Hill 4, the game, is split into two different segments, the apartment and the dreams. You experience the apartment segments exclusively in first person. You walk around, examine Henry's belongings, read notes, and solve puzzles. The Dream Worlds, on the other hand, play like your usual Silent Hill third-person survival horror. With one major change, though, that fundamentally shifts the focus of the entire game. One that ripples out and affects every related element. Henry has a limited inventory, and a storage box back home to store items. If that wasn't nice enough, just standing in Henry's solemn apartment is enough to start healing him back to full health. This clashes with survival horror game design, almost making Silent Hill 4 reminiscent of dungeon crawlers. Wait, though, these games are supposed to make you feel unsafe, right? Well, this is intentional. Long periods of comfort are atypical for a horror game, but it conveys something to us without words or tutorial. Henry considers his home to be a safe place. That statement might not mean much without context. There are monsters outside for one, and being comfortable in your own space is true for just about everyone, right? Well, you'd have to ask Henry about that. You might find that difficult because Henry isn't the most talkative. Or real. He never opens up about himself in any of the cutscenes and doesn't appear to have a visible arc. On the surface, he seems like just your average guy. For this title, we had a concept where we wanted to bring out the realistic, everyday aspects of the game. So the main character, Henry, isn't this super cool guy with anything special about him. We designed him to emphasize the idea of how he's an ordinary man you could find anywhere, who just so happens to be living in this ordinary apartment. Henry has been widely considered to be one of the weaker protagonists in the series. He exists as more of a passive observer to the events around him, which has led some fans to uncharitably accuse him of not having a character. But I don't buy it especially in a series that trained me to not take things at face value. Besides, I've always found that volumes can be spoken by silence. I still find value in quote-unquote silent protagonists for that very reason. In Hara's interview, she emphasizes wanting to make Henry as realistic of a person as possible. So, we should start not by looking at Henry as a character, but as if he were a real person. He dresses unassuming, like someone you might not go out of your way to talk to or notice. But what if that's on purpose? You can overhear his neighbors saying they don't know much about him at all, and it takes them days to even notice that something could be wrong. Not that they're in any rush to do anything about it. It seems like he doesn't leave his house often. If he does, he likely keeps to himself. We'd also need to ask why his parents didn't think to check in on him, leading to the conclusion that Henry's family is either distant or no longer a part of his life. His childhood was unsentimental after all. According to his inner monologue when exploring the apartment, since he's such a quiet guy, we can understand a lot about him by just paying attention to his thoughts and mannerisms. Silent Hill 4 believes that objects can hold sentimental weight, that one's memories can be held in everyday items. Look around your home, for example. I'll bet you have stories associated with all kinds of things in there. This is as true for Henry's apartment as it is for the dream world you visit as well. The building world even features it as a main puzzle. 
making you collect innocuous items that once belonged to past victims of the 21 sacrament killings. Instead of good memories, these objects house the regrets of their former owners. Birthday candles, a stuffed cat, a volleyball, all out of place. And we'll never know what happened or what could have been because these stories were cut short. Henry's quiet, and isn't the type of person to react outwardly to the horror happening around him when exploring the dream worlds. He's also a photographer. After all, he took most of the photos you can see in his apartment. But if you really look at these pictures, as much as the PS2 resolution will let you, that is, you'll notice something. They typically don't include people just nature or buildings, which makes sense. It's a lot easier to take a photo of nice scenery than directing people. Still, we're going to have to chip away at the game's metaphorical layers to learn more about Henry. So, okay, let's start with our hypothesis and build on it as we go. Silent Hill 4 is a game about anxiety. Henry, along with many others struggling with anxiety, is terrified of the world outside the comfort of his home. As someone who deals with anxiety himself, I relate to Henry a lot. Now, I know it might be overplayed for a video essayist to relate something in a game to the COVID pandemic, but quarantine was a pretty impactful moment in basically all of our lives, so it makes sense. I remember a time when my anxiety was at its highest, and even leaving outside with a mask could be too much for me. Everything from how Henry lives, his employment, and how he presents himself paints a picture of someone who desperately wants to blend into the background to avoid unnecessary conflict and contact because he's not comfortable with them. The gameplay conveys this to the player incredibly well, reworking the genre's uncomfortability in, again, a more subtle way. Gone is the ability to bring action to a screeching halt to sort through your inventory. Durability is now a mechanic for the game's strongest weapons, making you play the series like you've never had to do before. If you need to switch items in the middle of combat, that happens in real time too. Silent Hill 4 does not want you to be able to escape into menus and get away from the constant danger around you. This extra level of stress mimics how Henry must feel being outside of his safe space. He's out of his element, and this awkwardness is something we feel by just controlling the game. The controls are weird, but you do get used to it, and I think that's ultimately the point, to show how Henry is slowly adapting to his situation. Let's turn back to the perspective differences between the two modes of gameplay. Third person offers only a few degrees of separation between us and the game. There is us and our monitor, which serves as a window into the character we control and the nightmare they inhabit. In first person horror, those degrees of separation decrease, alternatively increasing our immersion. There is us and inside the screen, the world. With your field of view restricted, horror game developers are able to ramp up scares because threats are perceived at the same time as the player character. But Silent Hill 4 turns that idea on its head. The horror takes place in third person and the brief moments of downtime in first person. And this is intentional. The game designers are trying to convey Henry's mental state to the player. He views his apartment as safe, so he relaxes. But when he goes outside, he has to literally disassociate from himself to survive his fears. He has to look at himself from the outside in. Worth mentioning in this regard is the apartment world, where Henry explores the entire South Ashfield Heights apartment complex. Just running down the hall to make it to and from his room terrifies Henry. We can assume that this isn't a new thing for him either. Maybe a past trauma led to him always perceiving the outside world as hostile. Henry does show signs of yearning for more, to not be so dependent on his safe space. By examining any of the apartment windows, you can get a glimpse at downtown South Ashfield. 
The city Henry calls home. You can look out your window and such from room 302, but there's absolutely no intervention from outside, no interaction. That's part of the fear of isolation that I think is new for this installment, the idea that, ultimately, you're all on your own. And so this time, the protagonist is a unilateral victim, right? Just in the worst possible circumstances. Every time he goes to the other world, he's attacked by these restless souls, and he doesn't even know what's happening with his own situation, yet this impending doom just keeps bearing down upon him. So there's also that fear, I think. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It was this screen right here. The briefest look at an average city, dampened by an overcast sky, that made me instantly fall in love with this game. Not any horror set piece or the gameplay, but this quiet look at the city of South Ashfield. Ever since I was a kid, I've always had a fascination with staring out the window. I find it calming, how you can easily get lost in your thoughts. I'd always try to imagine what was going on in the people's lives that passed by, whether I was looking at a crowd while sitting in a cafe, or one of my university's classrooms. I just wonder, what happened in their lives to bring them to this moment, where our paths crossed? I never focused on one person in particular, just the crowd. What were they thinking about? Do they ever think about the fact that they themselves are being perceived as they go about their day? Were they going through their own problems? Were they happier than me? As a mere observer of a fraction of their life, you'll never truly know. And just like that, they're gone, and that could be the last you'll ever see of that person. I've never played a game that's made me feel, ironically, so seen. Its willingness to have these optional moments resonated with me so much that I'd make a beeline to the window every time I returned from the other worlds just to see what would change. Time passes as the game goes on with heavy amounts of detail put into making South Ashfield feel like a real place. The intent behind this is something a bit more devilish. They give Henry a window to look at a life that he cannot have, his only taste of the real outside world denied to him. You can see other residents of the apartment live out their daily lives and private moments, and it feels voyeuristic. You can look at them, stare at them for as long as you'd want, but you cannot reach them. You cannot communicate with them. You can call out to them, but they will never answer, because they cannot hear you. The window will always be there to serve as your prison bars, and you can only lightly bang on it in a futile effort. I wonder how that glass felt to Henry. Was it cold? Silent Hill 4 wants you to feel like a non-consensual voyeur, which might seem like a contradiction at first. Henry has been cut off from the outside world. People he finds in the dream worlds are either hostile, strange, suspicious, or dead. All he can do is spend his moments of comfort away from the nightmare, gazing out at others. There's a peephole that shows up one day, created by the last tenant when the room began to trap him, too. It offers a view into the bedroom of Eileen, Henry's next-door neighbor. I'm not fond of spying on her, and neither is Henry, I'd like to think. He didn't ask for this peephole, and based on how he treats and thinks of her in the game, I don't think he cares for it being there. But she is the closest person to him physically, a one-way ticket to the outside world. Henry's quietness could just as easily come across as struggling to understand and interact with others. His observing nature could be perceived as him wanting to make meaningful connections. He struggles with it, though. The entire room being self-explanatory symbolism, he cannot express himself, just stare and imagine how the lives of his neighbors play out. He's forced to watch normal people live their lives without a care in the world, blissfully unaware of his dire situation. 
One just as valid, if perhaps less officially supported, read I've seen pop up about Henry is that he might be neurodivergent. I think that reading adds a bit of extra depth to him, and I know plenty of people who relate with him even more because of this. You don't have to accept that as gospel, and it probably wasn't even an intentional choice, but it's something I'm fond of. Silent Hill 4 is cool, dude. To the outside world, Henry Townshend is a normal, everyday, quiet man. But internally, he has all of these pent-up anxieties about the world around him, which is why he gravitates towards being home alone so often. Again, this familiar, lonely place is safe to him. But what if that all went away one day? What if you realized that your home was never truly safe to begin with. Silent Hill 4 is about anxiety. The anxiety that comes with realizing you are a victim of domestic abuse. The second half of the game offers a complete gameplay shift to complement narrative reveals. Henry discovers that he and his neighbor Eileen are the planned final sacrifices for Walter's ritual, and she is now trapped in the dream world with him. Henry needs to escort her through every previous dream world with the challenge and horrors amplified as you try to keep her alive. Your ceiling fan, the main source of light in your room, crashes down. The apartment looks dark and murky now. You don't feel comfortable lingering around there anymore. Not only can Henry no longer heal here, but this space is slowly being haunted by the ghosts of the other world. Victims of Walter cause you actual harm unless dealt with. From a gameplay perspective, it challenges your familiarity with the space. It asks you to be as familiar with Henry's apartment as Henry is, to notice things aren't as they should be. After all, what's more horrifying than coming home to the feeling that someone has been in your house, rummaging through your things. From a story perspective, it conveys a pivotal idea. No matter what you do, now that you see the truth, things can never return to how they once were. If making you feel unsafe in your own home wasn't bad enough, Walter stalks you in the dream worlds and tries to hurt Henry and Eileen. You'll find that, despite his foreboding appearance and dual wield pistols, he's not much of a threat. You'll often just be more annoyed with him than anything. And that's because he doesn't want to kill you. He wants to inconvenience you. You're being taunted. He is playing with his victims as they slowly make their way towards the end of his ritual. The second half of Silent Hill 4 is pretty divisive, and is probably the most stressed I have ever felt playing a horror game. There is no downtime, you need to micromanage every single thing you do, and you aren't just responsible for getting yourself out of this, but Eileen as well. At points, it's beyond frustrating to play. It honestly feels like the developers are using Walter as a way to laugh at your expense. And I absolutely adore it and everything it stands for thematically. Also, in the same vein, can I talk about how much I really like Eileen? While a victim, certainly, she's not a damsel. A little detail I can appreciate in hindsight is how her AI's programmed. You can give her a weapon and she can actually hold her own fairly well. She's trying to survive just as much as you are. So they programmed her to be aggressive. She'll charge right in and fend for herself in a way that feels realistic. It's a nice balance to have because it feels like you're working together and watching each other's backs to make it through the situation. She looks after you to try to make sure you don't die and you look after her as well. If left alone or abandoned though, she can get possessed by the dream worlds. Annoying gameplay mechanic or charming addition to the themes. I say both can be true. Walter's an interesting character as well, being the subject of almost every note and cutscene you'll come across. If Silent Hill 4 is a metaphor about domestic abuse, Walter is the abuser. Walter is also a victim of abuse himself, having been abandoned as a baby and put through an orphanage run by a cult. 
It isn't a guarantee, obviously, but victims can become abusers if they don't receive the right kind of support they need to recover. The scariest part is that they don't always see that what they're doing is wrong. It's likely a subconscious reaction to past trauma. The story reasons for why Walter does what he does is that Henry is the final sacrifice, the intended receiver of wisdom after the ritual ends. He is able to haunt Henry the entire time because his corpse has been inside room 302's walls without Henry realizing it. The corruption has always come from inside the house. Make no mistake, there's absolutely nothing wrong with safe spaces, but their perceived safety can sometimes blind you to their realities. A more watchful eye might have seen some signs of the corruption coming from inside the apartment all along. During Henry's downtime, though, we'd rather brush aside these warnings due to being so preoccupied with surviving the worlds outside. On Henry's front door is a note from Walter, which tells him not to go outside. Walter never wanted him to leave because keeping him close and cooped up benefited his needs for the ritual. When a way out is revealed, it's on Walter's terms. Because the dream worlds spawn from him. They warp and corrupt Henry's perception of the outside world to keep him stuck in his room. Stepping away from the metaphor, that's a classic abuse tactic. Preying on weaknesses and creating a codependent relationship to foster trust. It's abstract because he's doing this as the apartment, but... It makes sense. Was this because Henry was just at the wrong place at the wrong time? Perhaps. But if we connect the dots with the implication of Henry's past childhood troubles, maybe he was drawn to Walter and Walter feels a connection to him. Henry has been to Silent Hill before, so maybe the town's attachment to Walter made that connection for them. But honestly, I feel like it doesn't matter. When you realize what's been going on all along, the facade is dropped entirely. That precious initial comfort is gone, and you realize that everything that happened in the first half of the game was meticulously set up to make you feel a sense of control that was never truly there. You are now relentlessly hunted, given no moments of peace. It's grueling. The places you once visited aren't the same. They've been changed ever so slightly, and you need to navigate through these and adapt while protecting another person. Henry, seeing Eileen assaulted and almost killed by Walter, decides to now go out of his way to keep her safe. He was always too late to save any of the other victims, but now has a chance to make up for that. This is someone who, realizing that he was and is a victim, gathers the strength to overcome his abuser and make sure Walter is never able to put anyone through that again. Henry and Walter are foils to one another, quiet men with baggage who have lived lives devoid of love. Walter uses his pain to hurt others, Henry to help them. At their final confrontation, Henry has nothing to say to Walter. There's no going back. But how does someone even go about fixing a situation like this? What does Silent Hill say to victims trapped in abusive households? Its answer is both simple, yet difficult. Leave. Cut ties. Find like-minded people who will support you in healthy ways, and get the fuck out. Don't go back and don't let that person hurt anyone else if you can help it. And I know that might sound unreasonable, a bit oversimplistic even. A lot of people don't have those options, reality isn't that kind even if we all think we know the answers. Victims could be emotionally or financially manipulated to be stuck in homes toxic for their mental health. Silent Hill 4 might not sit the player down and explain to them a step-by-step -step escape plan for abusive homes, but it gives them something just as valuable. Hope. Reassurance. That they can be strong. And everything will be okay. Guess I'll have to find a new place to live, huh?
Hey there, thank you for making it to the end of the video. This wouldn't have been possible without the following people's help. Thank you to my co-writer Jess my script editor Supreme Zerker, Hot Cider for the thumbnail, and the three wonderful people who helped do the interview voices. VZ, GC Vasquez, and Maria Eurofug. All of these people are amazing, go support them. I'm not sure if you're aware, but this little shindig I put on is supported via Patreon. If you'd like to see videos early, get your name in the credits, see behind the scenes content, and maybe even get a vocal shout out, click the link in the description to find out more. This month's Metal Royal Slimes are Alex Austin, Autumn Jennings, Corvin, and Nora Van, Happy Emmons, Hornkerling, I Frozen Ace, Jeremy DeForest, Looping Pyre, Moon Watcher, Renteca Bond, Snigs, Wayne is Boss, and your friend Chuck. Thank you once again for watching, and I will see you next time. Over there, I saw this dude getting schloinked.